Uh, thank you everyone for the participants, whether online or uh, in person, and uh, many thanks to the organizers of this conference. Um, so, my presentation will be about John Hicks' soul making theodicy, but I'm not going to be just repeating what he what he has said because you can simply do that by referring to his book. Uh, it's more of a critical um, critique, kind of critical point of view. So let's see what first he has to say. I will briefly uh, present his argument, and then uh, we will talk about the implications because that's what I care uh, the most. Um, uh, like making it more real life, having implications on the meaning of life. Um, so uh, John Hick um, faces the problem of evil and he, in his book, mainly in his other works, but he talks about the problem of evil mainly in the book called Evil and the God of Love. So that is the central book for his uh, soul making theodicy, which had a huge impact on philosophical and theological talks. Um, well, we are in the in a conference about uh, the problem of evil. So people have talked about types of evil, like moral evil, natural evil, metaphysical evil. I will not detail them. But um, interestingly, uh, John Hick also talks about um, uh, the evil evil, like the evil related to the demonic world. But he does not allocate a distinct category to them for two reasons. First, he says, well, we cannot examine the demonic world, uh, so it's going to be speculative. Um, for another one, um, we, we are seeing the manifestation of uh, demonic acts in our moral life. Uh, if there is a demon, if there is uh, the, the devil uh, seducing me to do things, uh, to murder someone, so basically that he, his act uh, is going to be manifested in my moral action so this is what he cares he he under uh, like brings that category under moral evil but i will not talk about the kinds that much um so if god is all good all powerful why there is evil if there is evil uh god is neither power either not all powerful or not uh omniscient so well, that is the uh, problem um he's facing um uh, giving like a brief overview um Hick says it is wrong to judge divine actions by, by human standards. There are different categories. Uh, we should be investigating the matter in different contexts. Um, for Hick, this is the general overview, the existence of evil does not necessarily negate God's existence or his goodness or his power, but it challenges the understanding of uh, understanding and formulation of theodicy. Um, uh, Hick's approach is apologetic, and he believes that uh, Christian theology's approach is apologetic. This is very, very important in understand in examining soul making theodicy. He th Hick does not believe that soul making theodicy creates faith. He rejects that right in the beginning of the book. He says it improves, it strengthens an already existing faith. So if uh, if you look at it from this perspective, it's not demonstrative. So for those who are looking for demonstrative proof when it comes to problem of evil, Hick is not your guy. Um, so he defends his position by these statements in the beginning of the book. Um, interestingly, he um, initiates by criticizing the traditional views of evil. Um, the traditional views of evil, whether it be uh, for St. Augustine or others, uh, and even Islamic theologians, um, they, in order to um, bring together the existence of an all-good, all-powerful evil with the existence of all-powerful, all-good God, with the existence of evil, they dismiss evil uh, altogether. Some of them go so far as to say, well, evil does not exist at all. It would be a logical inconsistency. I'm not talking about relative, uh, relative non-existence, absolute non-existence. Well, uh, Hick's um, uh, project is not that. Uh, in order to bring together uh, God with evil, he does not need to reject the existence of evil. He says evil does exist, it is real, it is not just on paper theoretical. It really, really exists. But there is a way to uh, put together God and this evil. Um, again, I will not be um, going so much into his, uh, his criticism of traditional traditional arguments, but uh, he takes 
um, an interesting path. He builds on the works of uh, Ironius, who was an ancient Greek philosopher, and he breaks, brings his arguments back to life, and uh, which was a revolutionary move uh, by Hick. Uh, for Hick, I'm just r reading uh, the titles, um, the criticism of traditional Christian theodicy, uh, is a narrative basis, uh, origin from angelic rebellion and human fall. Uh, this is a false narration. I will talk about that. Dependent, dependence on mythology. He considers the fall of man an original thing as a mythology, not as real historical happening. And uh, he finds issue morally with the collective punishment. If there was an original sin by Adam and Eve, why is God punishing all human beings by making us suffer in this world? So there is a moral problem to the original, uh, to the traditional understanding of a theodicy. And there are logical inconsistencies, according to Hick, in his argument, in the traditional argument. Call, um, Hick calls for a reassessment, a reinterpretation of... Uh... Oh, you're seeing that. How nice. I thought it's only me who's seeing that. All right, so he finds fault with uh, traditional theodicy and he calls for a reassessment and he does that quite successfully, but not in, in a demonstrative way. Um, so overview of soul making theodicy of Hick would be Hick's theodicy views the world as a place for soul making. He calls it the veil of the alley of soul making, uh, metaphorically, essential for spiritual and moral development. Um, um, very unique and interesting point about <laughs> his uh, his theodicy is the uh, his discussion of the great fall, like in Christianity, also in some some extent in Islam, but it's more bold in Christianity. They talk about uh, the fall of Adam and Eve from the heaven to the to this world, because of the original sin from eating uh, the forbidden fruit and stuff like that. He th thinks that, and um, uh, he thinks that this was not a historical fact. It didn't really happen. Um, the original fall, the original sin, and the fall are metaphorical things. He will explain what he means by these metaphors, uh, but for now, uh, it's a metaphor. So, for it, in order to uh, save himself from the traditional view, he uh, resorts to Irenean philosophy. Irenaeus had uh, a two-stage creation interpretation. He takes the Genesis, he looks at the verses, but he interprets... Uh, a specific passage um, very uniquely uh, that's not uh, that has not had so much uh, attention in, from other perspectives so this is the text from Genesis then God said let us make man in our image after our likeness he says look although many people would take these uh, like uh, synonymously the image and the likeness uh, they are in part synonym um, the, the, the uh, gospel uh, the scripture distinguishes these terms, so there should be a different meaning when we say image and uh, when we say likeness. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, for Irenaeus and for Hick, uh, the image will be the initial creation of a human being. Put on this earth without any fall, there was no fall from the heaven, it's a metaphoric expression. The fall is putting humans in a hostile environment. He Interestingly, he uh, advocates uh, his arguments uh, by accepting evolution. He says, <laughs> God first put the human being um, in the world, not capable of rational thought, in a hostile environment. He had to evolve, get through an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary process, um, find reason, then following that reason, come to a point to understand that there must be a God. So this is what he means by, by, by the fall. There was no original sin. The sin is his uh, human shortcomings. The fall is human beings' life on this earth, not on um, the heaven coming, being dumped to this world. So uh, it's a journey from natural life to the spiritual <coughs> life that mirrors God's qualities. So uh, the, the, the thesis is this. Human being was imperfect. He was put here through evolutionary process. He was gonna get reason. He was gonna get familiar with God. He was going to actively and by free will accept that there must be a God and I should, I, 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 I should uh, investigate that matter. So free will comes in. I will talk about that. Um, but 
what is that likeness? The likeness point that, that Hick points is this. He says, okay, we are creating God's image. We are human beings. We got through the process of evolution, but we must reach a point that we become divine. At this stage, we, we reflect the, the, the divine um, qualities, uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, Sufism, I would say, when we get to be a perfect man, uh, we, we fully and entirely reflect divine names and qualities. Of course, he's not a Sufi, the, the two paths, the two tracks are different, but still, he's not talk, he doesn't talk about a uh, perfect man, but for him, we are normal, primitive, animalistic human beings when we came to this world and from that point we need to get to the likeness of God we, we need to become a divine human being that is the project he's, uh, he's talking about so we were hu homo sapiens um, but we were not ready for human fellowship for divine fellowship according to Hick we didn't deserve to be in the kingdom of God at that stage because we were only animal we had we were human animals at that stage we didn't deserve to be in god's presence that's why we were put here uh, to get evolved to get to that point so it was kind of a spiritual awakening um he says interestingly when it comes to free will and moral development a world with temptations with um with temptations of doing the wrong and still trying to do the moral moral things having a moral choice is much 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 better than a world in which we, not, we are innately virtuous. If God created us, which is a criticism, they say, okay, why did not create us in a way that we always choose the good? Uh, it says, okay, that's a possibility, but let's say that that could happen. Have this on one side. Compare that, like, I'm, I'm created in a way that I always choose right. <coughs> is this better or would it not be better to have a moral choice to do the wrong thing and to do the right thing and after considering I choose the wrong, I choose the right thing. This one, the second scenario is much better than the first one. This is how he's arguing. Um, the world for, the world in this context, in this framework is not a paradise. It's a place of hardship. We are going to be um, achieving soul cultivation and perfection. Um, it's not a project of pleasure maximization and uh, here he brings an interesting uh, example he says uh, consider your parents when you were a kid uh, you wanted to eat chocolate lots of chocolate it gives you pleasure it gave you pleasure but your parents didn't allow you uh, to do that it's not that your parents do not love you they do love you the thing that the, the reason they're avoiding your immediate pleasure right at that moment was for for you to have virtue whether that be your health or uh, moral virtue uh, whatever it is. So um, God in this framework avoids immediate, uh, human in this framework does not have immediate pleasure to achieve the divine human um, and having developing virtues. Um, I'm going to come back to that eschatological uh, point later on, but let me just briefly touch this. Um, John Hicks Theodicy is eschatological, um, what do I mean by that? He says, don't look, for, look, don't look at the past in order to understand the theodicy. Don't look at the original sin. There was no original sin. It is metaphorical. What is going to happen is that you're going to suffer. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to gain virtue, morality, become perfect in this life. You are gaining virtue. That is a positive thing, but that is not enough. There must be a place in which you're rewarded for the hardships and sufferings that you have had. And that is the hereafter. So for him, the whole picture is eschatological. And that, um, that, that place is the kingdom of God, the, the other world, in which you are in the presence of God uninterruptedly and perfectly uh, uh, you're, you're experiencing him. That's supposedly going to be justifying and making up for all the sufferings that we have had. So at this point, um, it is very clear that his argument is not uh, demonstrative. He, he cannot prove, it, uh, prove this uh, through a demonstration, through logical reasoning. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of uh, eschatology. Um, let's hold that thought. I will come back to that. Um, about human origin, I already covered this, but let me repeat because I'm going to be um, looking at it from a different angle. Um, 
humans were created as animals, as primitive homo sapiens. And from there, um, the human being was to be a divine human being. Uh, how does that happen? He says that happens through free will. If we were created perfectly as perfect moral beings, we didn't have free will. We, all, we only needed to be good. We couldn't be wrong. But in that case, there was no case for a reward or punishment in the hereafter. So I need to have a free will. I need to have that choice to make that choice so that in the other world, God either punishes me if I, if I chose wrong or he's going to be rewarding me if I chose right. So uh, free will comes in, comes in play. But he does not advocate, like he's not offering a free will defense. That's only instrumental in his argument. This is one of the interesting parts, uh, the epistemic distance. I had not th uh, like thought of this before or heard of this before in arg arguments. Uh, he says, in order for you to have um, a f free will, in order for you to have free choice, you must have forgotten that there was a God. There is a God, or there was a time that you were aware of such a perfect God. So in order for this to happen, he goes on and on giving arguments. I'm just pointing to the conclusion. He says, in order for us to, um, to be able to choose to go to God by our choice, by free will, I need to forget that there was a God and I was in, in union with him. And, and that's what he calls epistemic distance from God. We forget that there was a God. He somehow makes us forget this. We also have this in Islam. Uh, uh, the verse of Alast in the Quran says like, am I your Lord? Everybody testified, yes, you are. But then he made us forget that there was such a conversation, such a deep dialogue, if you could call it a dialogue. And uh, so that is that makes perfect sense in this context, a theological context, that we needed to have an epistemic distance from God, not remembering him, so that we have the free choice. And if we had the free choice, our actions, our choices had real uh, uh, moral value. Otherwise, it would be meaningless. And I agree with this. So God's hidden nature requires personal and interpretive engagement. We already talked about this. He uh, talks about the myth of fall. Uh, it was not that we were in heaven and just uh, God set us aside from his grace. Okay, go live uh, on, on a world and tolerate the hardship. That is not the case um, for, for, for Hick. That's a mythological language that scripture chooses to use. So our coming to this world is not a fall, but what he called fallenless. It's a term that he has kind of invented. It was not a fall from heaven. It is being created in this world as animal to go through evolution. Oh. Yeah. Um, so it was the, the whole project is a great gradual evolution from lower forms of life to a state capable of recognizing the divinity. And when we come to this point, we will be able to recognize the divine. And then, and then he will show us his science. Immediately when we are born, uh, when we are in that animalistic state, God is not showing himself because of the epistemic distance. We will take steps, we will come to a point when we can uh, reason and we go after the divine. Interestingly, the text says, then God shows us his science. Again, another uh, compared to a similar point with Islam says, uh, we have put our science upon the horizon and within yourself. This is what Quran says, for those who understand. Okay, I'm looking, I don't see any sign of God. I don't see any sign of God in, like here within me because I'm still in that uh, animalistic soul confinement. I need to free myself of this, come to a spiritual human celestial self, understand that then I will be able to, to see those signs. So uh, a kind of similarity between the two sister religions, Islam and Christianity. But uh, so much so about the, uh, about the explanation of um, his theodicy. Uh, what are the implications here? Uh, the implication, what are the conclusions and implications? The conclusion is that his argument is not demonstrative. Uh, you cannot defend this on logical basis. It's a matter of faith. He says this right in the beginning of the book. My theodicy cre does, not create, does not create faith. It strengthens, it improves the faith that you already have, um, which can make us think that uh, the whole project of theodicy is not a matter of rationally convincing you, it's um, already poking a faith that you are supposedly have. Um, but if you paid attention, we talked about eschatology. Um, 
if we are not able to uh, talk about demonstrative proof, how are we able to convince those who are, um, say, agnostic or atheists? At this point, I, uh, I uh, even he, like Hick himself accepts this. Um, we cannot do that through Hick's theodicy. If you are looking to be convinced by uh, by logic, Hick is not your guy. Um, what are the implications? Uh, the implications is that if you are um, a person of faith, already having that faith, it gives you a roadmap. John Hick's theodicy gives you a roadmap of how you evolved um, uh, through this hostile environment acquiring reason you must be a virtuous person you must have uh, morality in your life you must follow moral path uh, be a moral person to be able to become the likeness of God so uh, he brings morality right into our practical real life his theodicy is not a, a theoretical framework it's a practical guide it makes you take practical actions practical steps to reach the divine um, it, what are other implications? Um, one other interesting implication would be um, compassion towards other human beings. If I am to be a likeness of God, I, I'm not alone in this project. There are other, other human beings. Not only I am the person who should be going up this ladder to reach the divine, but also I should be helping other people to achieve this. Again, in our real life, in our practical life, uh, this theodicy reflects itself and uh, shows itself. It adds a profound meaning uh, to our life, uh, a life that is not just individualistic. We are not talking about individualism. We are a community-based. I'm not alone in this journey towards God. We are a community helping each other. It's a give and take to achieve the divine. Um, I think I've reached the end of my time. Um, um, we will talk about the questions and answers, but I think there is going to be another talk. So I'm going to be cutting it short here. Thank you very much for your patience. And sorry you had to tolerate my voice this long. Uh, Dr. Fallahi, the floor is yours. Thank you.